Hello from New York. I'm Steve Kornacki here with Democratic Congressman Jerry Nadler, Maddie Duckler from Americans for Tax Reform, and your attendant of the Center for American Progress, and tax journalist David K. Johnston. So, uh, Maddie, I, I wanted to, to pick this back up with you because, you know, right now the, the pursuit of the grand bargain that Obama is engaged in, or, or you know, maybe, maybe it's just a ruse we were saying earlier, but he, he seems to be engaged in, um, is basically, in his view, trading off the, the reduction in Social Security and the more means testing for Medicare for getting rid of some of these loopholes, getting rid of some of these deductions in a way that would increase revenue. That's the key. This is the second pass at getting more revenue that the White House wants to take this year. And I, I, to me, this looks like this is falling back on the same basic fault line that's, that's driven politics for the last generation, which is the Republican position has been, let's talk about deductions, let's talk about loopholes, but anything we eliminate there, anything we cut out there, we want to make up for by lowering the rates overall. So the key for Republicans is revenue neutral. The key for Obama, the key for Democrats is increasing revenue. Is that an accurate take on where you stand? That you cannot get sure. more revenue from, from tax reform? Sure, and I think there's a couple things to keep in mind here. First is that revenue neutrality is not, it's a Republican ideal, but it's not a Republican idea. 1986, this is bipartisan uh, agreement that revenue that tax reform needed to be revenue neutral, and that was a good starting point. That's how they actually got something done eventually. Uh, secondly, you know, looking at what the president has proposed, you know, he says he's in, for, in favor of tax reform. He says that his opening salvo with his budget is to give uh, Republicans something in entitlement reform, so maybe they'll come to the table on revenues. Two ways that I don't take him seriously on this. The first is that you look at his budget, it brings us up to 20% of GDP in terms of revenues, which we have never reached in the modern era, save for once, about 2000 when the economy was going gangbusters. So he's saying that with all these tax increases, with all the new revenues he wants to bring in, he's going to us up to 20% of uh, GDP in revenues. It's just not realistic. Secondly, when he says he wants to offer entitlement reform, knowing that that's kind of the bait he wants to bring Republicans in with, um, his entitlement reform, of course, is chain CPI, with, with Social Security. And what that amounts to is a uh, middle class uh, income tax hike because of the bracket creep that that introduces that also cuts benefits for current uh, beneficiaries. So that's his entitlement reform uh, bargaining chip. And this is what he's looking at at tax reform. I don't see this as a serious but he's now, now to, to the extent that's his, his bargaining chip, it's interesting to hear you say that because to the extent that's his bargaining chip, it's because so many Republican voices for the past few years have been urging him to, to make that his big mm -hmm. concession to them. They've sure. been saying, we want chain CPI. We want. We think there's a huge social security crisis. We think social security is contributing to the deficit. And this is this. And so, and so it's very interesting to hear you. I don't think it's. But I don't think it's chain CPI that's been kind of like the gold standard for anyone. I think it's. An, it's the notion that we should be looking at how we're calculating benefits. We should look at how we're calculating. You know, the entire edifice of spending and taxes at the federal level, because obviously something's wrong with it. If it's not keeping up with actual wages, not keeping uh -huh. up with actual income growth. You know, but I don't think chain, anyone's saying chain CPI is the greatest. Well, thing the Republicans have been saying do change CPI. All these yes. Republicans have been saying do. This is, I think, the exact conundrum we have, which is Republicans want the president to be the one to come out for change CPI, Medicare reforms, etc. They don't actually want to. Once once he's actually done it, then they creep away and say, oh, we don't, we're not serious. And I think you know the fact that the. NRSC, the NRCC, the House Republicans are attacking the president on chain CPI, just like Karl Rove's group attacked the president on Medicare cuts in 2010 and the 2010 elections, shows that they want to have both sides of this. They're it never going to do tax cuts, and they want to hit the president for the, med for the entitlement reforms after demanding it as their price for deficit it, reduction for four years. It, show, it shows the, the political foolishness of the proposal, because it's like uh, Charlie Schultz in the football. Um, uh, the Republicans keep putting it out there and saying, support chain CPI, support chain CPI, support these things. And the moment uh, the, the, the president does, they're going to attack the Democrats for doing it. They did it with the Medicare in 2010. It's, it's political poison as well as being wrong substantively. But let me just say one other thing that uh, was said a moment ago, and that is that, um, yes, we're asking, uh, the president is asking probably for 20 percent uh, GDP in taxes, and it's going to go higher. It's going to have to go to 22 percent probably over time because as our population ages, more people will be, a larger percentage of the population will be on Medicare, a larger percentage will be on Social Security. And even though Social Security is self-financing, it, it does not add to the budget deficit, it does not really affect the budget deficit. You pay into it, you take out of it, but it is figured as if it were part of the budget deficit. So the percentage that government uses counting Social Security has to go up simply because of the demographics of the population. <laughs> and the only, and the only, let me just say this, the, the only thing that is really controllable 
unless you want to do things like start cutting Social Security benefits, which is discretionary spending as a percentage of the budget and of the GDP is going way down. If the president gets his way, the Republicans are far worse, but if the president gets his way, it'll be non-defense discretionary spending, or maybe discretionary spending, I forget which, will be 1.7 percent of GDP in 15 years. It's now 3.1 percent. It's already non-discretionary defense, uh, non-defense discretionary spending is already the lowest. It's, but, it's but, but, you know, what, I, what I think, what I think you're, you're getting at here is, is, to me, is a very interesting point about all this is, is that you ask people specific questions about the size and scope of government, about, uh, you ask them philosophically about the size and scope of government, they want a small government, they want a lean government, they think it's too big right now. You start asking them about specific programs, about safety net programs, about programs that aid the poor, they are all very that's, popular. That's, that's, and it costs, and as you're saying, it costs a lot of money if you're going to have the kind of social safety net that people on individual questions say they want. That's because of what Elliot Spitzer said before, people don't know what the federal government spends money on. The fact is we're spending less and less as a percentage of the economy and less and less in absolute terms on things like uh, 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 aid to, college, to kids to go to college today. Uh, college is becoming unaffordable yeah. on things like uh, almost any social expenditure we're spending less as a percentage what of the they, economy. What they, what they, what they